people. I don't think my keyboard is, I don't think it needs unmuted. Praise the Lord, everyone. Yeah, it's unmuted. If we could all stand. In Psalms chapter 150, verse 6, it says, Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. And I, you know, I do this a lot. But when I do this, I try to find a verse that, you know, means something to all of us at that time or what we're reading or so forth. But the past three weeks, and pastor will correct me if I'm wrong. But I know of we had one get the Holy Ghost on a Wednesday. We had one kid on Easter get refilled with the Holy Ghost. And we had another kid get the Holy Ghost on Easter. Those three things right there should make us praise the Lord all day. But you did. But, but it isn't that it just says everything that hath breath praise the Lord. It's that it repeats itself. Praise ye the Lord. It's making a statement, and we need to make a statement with our praise. So if we could just start this service off with some praise and worship. Glory and honor to Jesus, let there be glory.
Into this house to praise him. 
you, Jesus. I'm glad we've come to give him some praise tonight because he is a worthy God. He's worthy of all the praise we can give him. Now, I know there's none of you here that knew me when I, back when I was a dirty, rotten, sinning scoundrel. But I was not a nice person when I was a dirty, rotten, sinning scoundrel. I didn't have nice things to say to people, and I cursed like a sailor when I was a dirty, rotten, sinning scoundrel. But when I got the Holy Ghost, I traded my cussing for praising. I traded my off-collar jokes for praising. I traded all the negative and bad things I could say for praising. And I'm telling you, I'd rather give him praise. I'd rather worship him and say he is holy, he is holy, he is holy. God, you got to give up one thing so you can pick up another. You can't carry everything in your hands you always had and keep picking stuff up. You got to give up one thing so you can pick up another. Amen? Amen? That's the way it works. That's the way it works. Praise God. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer and we're going to take these before the Lord. As I mentioned in prayer meeting, the one request on the front of all of our minds is the Sowards family. We are sure going to miss Elder Sowards. Now, you don't know how many times I've thought about the times when I was preaching and I heard, preach it, from the back of the church. And uh, my, we are going to miss, miss that solid rock who has been part of the foundation of our church. But he sure left an impression on a whole bunch of us. He really has. Let's pray for his family. Let's ask them, God, to comfort them. As I've already mentioned, the service will be here Saturday at 1 o'clock. Visitation will start at noon uh, and then service at 1. So uh, I know it would honor them if you are able to be here to come and uh, give honor to him uh, and his life and his being a godly man in an ungodly world. So let's pray for that family. Let's pray for also D and Eber, they call for service, both of them are sick, as well as Carl and Leora are both sick, so let's pray for them. Let's lift up James Vaness as we've been praying against cancer, and uh, uh, Gary's, Gary's uh, grandson Daniel in the hospital, let's pray for him, ask the Lord to touch him, Sister Reardon uh, in uh, uh, the nursing home, let's lift her up in praise. And others on this prayer list tonight. We need to pray God's touch upon. How many of you have got a need, an unknown, an unspoken need that God knows about it? Whether you've taken it to the Lord or whether you're just carrying it as a burden, God already knows. He already knows. So let's take it all to God tonight and believe the Lord to minister and pray for this service that God will bless us tonight in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you, God. Lord, we're gathered in the name above every name. There's no name greater than your name. And, Lord, when we speak that name, there's peace. When we speak your name, God, there's peace. There's peace in our spirit. There's peace that surrounds us, oh, God. When we just speak your name, there's joy in speaking the name of Jesus. And there is power when we speak that name. So, Lord, tonight we come before you in the only saving name. And we come before you bringing many needs before you tonight. We pray for Sister Ayrton in the hospital. God, that you would touch and minister this precious lady of God. Let your hand be upon her, God, we pray. And Lord, you're able to touch her tonight and minister to her. We pray, God, that you would touch and minister to James. God, we pray against cancer in his body. And pray your healing virtue, Lord, that you would touch him. And touch Daniel, Lord, that baby in the hospital, two years old. I pray, God, for Daniel, that, Lord, you would minister to that baby. For Carl and Leor and Dee and Eva, God, and others that are sick, we lift them up in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray for them in Jesus' name. Let your hand be upon them, God. I pray, Lord, by your power, Lord, that you minister every hand that was raised in this sanctuary. God, we give it to you tonight. We surrender it to you tonight. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray, oh God, 
that you touch every need, and especially for those that are lost. God, the backslidden, those away from God, we pray tonight, Lord, that you get a hold of them. Let their hearts be stirred and be changed and be drawn back to the altar. Bring them back to you, O oh God, we pray. As the prodigal came running back to his father, I pray, God, that, Lord, you deal with the heart of backsliders and cause them, Lord, to come and seek your face. Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus. Trust him. Thank you, Jesus. How I proved him, Lord, Lord. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, all for grace to trust him.
encourage you and come on up. You may be seated. We're going to worship the Lord and give him tonight. Give unto the Lord. What a blessing it is to serve him. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Brother Stephen, ask God's blessing on our worship and giving. Let's all say, happy, happy. Administrative, administrative, professional day. How many of you does that fall for? Oh. Me. <laughs> Sister Missy. So, Sister Missy does a lot around here that nobody ever sees, and she don't tell nobody. And she, sometimes she does things we don't even know, <laughs> and she tells us later. So we would like to give her something. And I, she's not getting up, so I guess I'll have to go to her. No, I can't. <laughs> and there you enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. Take them over there. Sure. You want, you want to know what it is? It's a million dollar check. How many more of those? <laughs> I'll hold it if you need me to. Thank you so much. I'm going to the Olive Garden or the Longhorn or Cheddar's or the Yard House, but I don't even know what that is. But I'm going. <laughs> Woohoo! Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Had a good day. Amen. Don't you love Sister Missy? Yeah. Give her a really big hand. <laughs> I love you guys a lot. We love her so much. Thank God for her and her family. And just so thankful that God put them here and uh, bless them and that she gives orthopedic care <laughs> when needed. <laughs> yeah, it was probably harder to get down there. Than I don't know what Sister Crystal has done, but she has somehow hurt herself. I mean, she's already been to the chiropractor and I guess got to go back, all kinds of stuff. So, praise the Lord, everybody. Praise Amen. The Lord. It's good to have Brother and Sister Sykes with us tonight. We welcome them. Appreciate them visiting. They came to surprise uh, Sister Casto and Sister Stevens, and, and it was a surprise. So, uh, uh, they're thrilled to see them, and we are too. So, we thank God that they're here and with us tonight. All right, I'm going to talk to you for the next little bit, probably more than anything, because I want to talk to you about something very important. And there's a scripture in the Old Testament that says, if the foundations be destroyed, what will the righteous do? If the foundations be destroyed, what will the righteous do? That's a pretty sobering thought when we think about it. And so we have to think, okay, what are the foundations that we are talking about? What are those foundations that hold the church? 
What are the foundations that hold us, that support us, that keep us strong, that keep us standing when the winds of adversity come, when the tests and the trials come, when the enemy comes in like a flood? What, what is it that holds us up? Now, I think probably the first thing we would mention and, and the first thing that would come to my mind is one of the foundations is prayer. Absolutely, prayer. Prayer is the base of our foundation. What we have with God, we got through prayer. We keep our walk with God through prayer. We stay connected to Jesus through prayer. We stay full of the Holy Ghost through prayer. So prayer is a base of our foundation and a vital part of our foundation. And if we ever lose prayer, if prayer ever goes by the wayside, if prayer ever begins to be ignored, we're in trouble as the church of the living God. We are, we, if prayer becomes secondary to us, if prayer becomes not a priority but a secondary thing in our life, if worldliness or entertainment or something else becomes a greater priority than prayer, we're in trouble. Prayer is a base and a foundation. So that would definitely be part of the foundation of our church. And then, of course, faithfulness. Faithfulness is a foundation of our church. Faithfulness in us standing. That faithfulness holds the foundation. Faithfulness, faithfulness brings us together. It's the mortar that brings us. We come tonight. You're in church tonight because you're faithful. You're faithful. It's, it brings us together. It's like mortar that, that establishes. And where two or three are gathered, we know God's going to be in the midst. A threefold cord is not easily broken. So there is power in unity and there's power in togetherness. And that is brought together through faithfulness and being faithful to God. There is our salvation experience, being born again of water and of spirit. That is a common thread among all of us. We've all been born again of water and spirit. We've been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. We've been filled with the Holy Ghost. Anybody got the Holy Ghost? We've been filled with the Holy Ghost. And that is our part of our foundation. I would even go as far as to say that that is the blocks of our foundation. That is, we can, that is we, we've laid the foundation through prayer. We've applied the mortar through faithfulness. And then that born-again experience is the blocks of our foundation. And then there is the eternal doctrine of the oneness of God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. He said, I am God, and beside me there is no other God. The devils believe there is one God and they tremble. It is a foundation of the church. It is a strength of the church. I believe you want to you bring fear to hell, you start reading scriptures aloud about the oneness of God. Devil starts tormenting you, you start going to scriptures that declare there's one God because he trembles. He trembles when he hears that there's one God. They know there's one God and they tremble. And that is the strength of the foundation of their church. But I want to talk to you about another part of our foundation that cannot be ignored. I want to talk to you about another part of the foundation of our church and our walk with God. That we must hold fast. That we must make sure that we are committed to. And that is a lifestyle of holiness. A lifestyle of holiness. We must hold fast to a lifestyle of holiness. It is not something that is just something that we do as a label. A holiness is not a label. Holiness is not a denomination. Holiness is not something that we just label as an old time religion. Holiness is the nature and character of who God is. 
It's who God is. Now, I'm not getting much shouting on this one. I'm not getting much shouting right now. We, we, we were shouting a minute ago. We're, we're not shouting now. But holiness. Folks, there's power in holiness. There is power in the holiness of God. And I want to go to a scripture, Leviticus. That's where I want to start tonight. Probably an unusual place to start in the book of Leviticus. Uh, we've got some young preachers in our church. And they probably would not normally choose a scripture out of the out of the intriguing book of Leviticus. You know, Leviticus is a hard book. It's a hard book. You, there, there's no storyline in Leviticus at all. There's no storyline. There are no characters in the book of Leviticus to, to, to develop a storyline. I mean, you don't have any. You don't have any Goliaths to slay. You don't have any any Red Seas to part. You don't. You don't have any fire on the mountain. You, you don't. The Book of Leviticus is is just absent of miracles. There's no miracles in 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 the book, and there's no great battles in in the Book of Leviticus, and there's no speaking characters in the book. No plot. No plot in there at all. We've got some teachers in here. They understand plot. They understand that, that plot is what makes the story interesting. Leviticus don't have the interesting plot. It doesn't. It, it, it just doesn't have it. See, what you have in Leviticus from the very first to the end. Now, there, there is one. Let, let me say this. I want to make sure I get this right. Because there is one place, and it's in Leviticus chapter 10. And God kind of just sticks this in there. Because Leviticus is God speaking from Leviticus 1 to the end. And it's not like Job where Job has a conversation with God. It's just God speaking. But then in Leviticus chapter 10, God throws in this little twist right in the middle of the book. And there is a, an occurrence that happens with Nadab and Abihu. Abihu is not some Louisiana prophet or something. <laughs> Nadab and Abihu. And the Bible says that they offered strange fire to the Lord. And when they offered strange fire to the Lord, the Lord sent back his own fire. And literally consume them in Leviticus chapter 10. Aaron had a problem with it. He had a problem with it. And he went to Moses. And Moses said a few things to him. And, and Aaron never mentioned it again. They are never spoken of after that point in the word of God. Outside of that occurrence in Leviticus chapter 10, the book is God speaking. It's almost like we could say Leviticus is compared to the Gospels of the New Testament, while Exodus would be compared to the book of Acts in the New Testament. Book of Acts gives us the plan of salvation, right? We find the plan of salvation in the book of Acts. We find God's redemption, God, how, God, how God has made a way for us to be saved in the book of Acts. And then the Gospels, or the, not the Gospels, the Epistles. The Epistles tell us from Romans to Jude how to live, how to walk, how to behave. So in the Old Testament, Exodus is God's plan of redemption. It's the blood applied to the door. It gives us worship in the book of Exodus, and it gives us service to God. And then in the book of Leviticus, it's God telling them how to live. And it's God speaking to Israel. And he's instructing them on how they are to live. Leviticus chapter 11 
And we're going to start at verse 44. The 11th chapter of the book of Leviticus. And verse 44. You got it? Amen. For I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves. Set yourselves apart. New Testament says come out from among them. Set yourselves apart. He says in verse 44, your, And ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Anything that creepeth into your spirit. Now, I want you to think, when the children of Israel went down into Egypt, there were 70. They went down because of the famine. Joseph was already down there. And they were coming, the 70 were coming down. When they left Egypt, they had been there 430 years. They had been in Egypt 430 years. When they left Egypt, there were 600,000 men. Now, when they came down, there were 70. Now, there's 600,000. In 430 years, that generation, that, that generation of 70 had passed on. And other generations had passed on. And now... They are 430 years removed from the teachings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And for 430 years, they have been saturated with Egyptian culture. They have been saturated with Egyptian lifestyle. All that this generation knew was the lifestyle of the Egyptians. 430 years removed from the generation of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob coming down, the 70 souls. So that's all they knew. So what they are hearing, they're hearing for the first time. They're not, this is not a repeat class. It's not a refresher course. This is God speaking to them for the very first time. And so God is speaking to them in very elementary terms. You know, when a new convert comes into church, you don't tell them, why don't you go ahead and read the book of Revelation and tell me how, what it's about. You point him to the book of Acts. And you, and you say, read that and let's talk about it. But you don't point them to the revelation. And so God is speaking to Israel in very elementary terms. And he says unto them, in verse 44, Neither shall you defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Ye shall therefore be for I am. This is the law of the beasts and of the fowl and of every living creature that moveth in the waters and every creature that creepeth upon the earth. Look at verse 47. To make a difference, to make a difference between the unclean and the clean. He said, I've got to teach you. I've got to instruct you on what is clean and what is unclean. I've got to help you understand that there are some things in this world you don't do. 
And there are places you don't go. And there are things you don't say. And there's stuff you don't look at. There is clean and there is unclean. And I've got to teach you between the clean and the unclean. I've got to teach you what is holy and what is not holy to make a difference. And see, the thing is, the difference is not establ established by society or by culture. What is unclean in the Word of God is clean in Amer unclean in American culture and it's unclean in European culture. It's unclean in American culture and it's unclean in Asian culture. When God distinguishes between the clean and the unclean, God has said there are some things we do not do. So he's teaching them in very elementary terms in the book of Leviticus. And God spends the entire book instructing them on how to live. He instructs them in the entire book on how to walk with God. Last part of verse 47 says, And between the beast that may be eaten and the beast that may not be eaten. There are things he said you just don't touch. Now, I'm not going into dietary laws tonight. That's not, we're, that's not the purpose of this Bible study. I do want to talk to you. There is a, 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 a cry. There's a call for holiness. There's a call for holiness. Well, Brother Johnson, you're talking to us out of the Old Testament. You need to be talking to us out of the New Testament. We'll get there in a minute. But let's understand something about the Old Testament. When you read the New Testament, how many times in the New Testament do you read the words, and it is written? And it is written. And it is written. Where do you think it was written? The New Testament wasn't written when the old, when the, during the times of the New Testament church. The Gospels, they were living the writing of the Gospels. They were living the writing of, of, the, of the epistles. And so those things were not, they weren't referring to New Testament writing. What were they referring to? Old Testament writing. They were referring to what, what had already been established by God in the Old Testament as a shadow. As a shadow. So the Old Testament teaches us by shadow. The New Testament teaches us by substance. The substance of the New Testament is the shadow of the Old Testament. And if your substance doesn't fit your shadow, then something's wrong. Your substance should fit your shadow. It should be a correlation. If, if, if your shadow is this long and your substance is that long, you're missing something somewhere. So we have to understand that the substance of the New Testament, go ahead and put up 1 Peter chapter 1. Substance of the New Testament finds its origin in the shadow of the Old Testament. Chapter 1 and verse 13 of 1 Peter. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Never say my mind. Say my mind is very important. Because your battles are won and lost right here. Your battles are won and lost right here in your mind. Wherefore, gird up, strengthen, strengthen your mind. Protect your mind. Doesn't the, the book of uh, the Old Testament tell us, guard your heart with all diligence. For out of it flows the issues of life. Guard your heart. You've got to guard your mind. You've got to determine, choose what goes in and out of this right here. What you allow yourself to think on. What you allow yourself to dwell on. 
Because when it starts here, if you leave it there, it won't be long until it gets here. And then once it gets here, it's not long until it gets here. And it's just a, becomes action. So gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober, hope to the end, for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Verse 14. As obedient children, not, of fash uh, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy. So be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is, it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. The substance of the New Testament is found in the shadow of the Old Testament. And the shadow of the Old Testament points to the substance of what should become, how we should live in the New Testament. Because it is written, be ye holy as I am holy. There's another scripture in Leviticus. I didn't give this to the guys, but it's just like the one that we just read in Leviticus 20. And God is repeating. He says, sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. And if we read that, if we were to take that from the message, it says, set yourselves apart. For a holy life because I am your God. The Amplified Version puts it this way. You shall consecrate yourselves and be holy. Read through the word of God. 544 times from Genesis to Revelation the word holy appears. 43 times holiness appears in the word of God. You think holiness is important to God? What is holiness? Holiness is purity. Holiness is, is cleanliness. Holiness is undefilement when it applies to us. Holiness is what God is. God is holy. And we live in a time, we live in a, a day that demands holiness. It demands there be a church that is holy. I know we're living, I, I know what's going on in the church world. I know what's happening all around uh, the world. And, I, and I, I, I know what's, how Christians are thinking. And I'm not talking necessarily about apostolics, but Christians in general are thinking. And there's a whole spirit of compromise that's sweeping through the Christianity today as a whole. And people are compromising. I remember, I remember listening to a, a, a radio program and, and they were talking to a, a they were interviewing a young man because he was suing his school because they were not allowing him to take his boyfriend to, to the prom. And so he was suing his school. And they had somebody there, of course, uh, to uh, argue the other side and so forth. And so they began to present a biblical stance on it. And uh, the, the, they used the word according to the Bible. And the guy that was interviewing said, do you mean to tell me you think we should live by the Bible? And that was his response. Do you really think we should live by the Bible? And that's the thinking of so many people in our world, in our society today. But it is the church. It is the church of the living God. It is the church of truth that has the grace of God that goes deeper and has more power to change the heart of man than any other psychiatrist or psychologist or anybody else because there is a spirit of holiness that dwells in the people of the living God. There is a desire for holiness on the inside of us. And our world, I know, I know our world's a pressure cooker. I know our world's a pressure cooker, and there's a pressure on the church, and there's pressure on the ministry to compromise our faith. And this, this pressure is, in, is immense in what we're going through. But the Bible tells us to hold 
fast. Hold fast. Hold fast the doctrine. Hold fast the profession of your faith. Revelation 2.25 says, hold fast till I come. Let me tell First United Pentecostal Church, holiness, we've got to hold fast to the holiness of God. We've got to hold fast to our separation from the world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The book of Leviticus, when he said, I am holy, that was God speaking. There wasn't some, some conversation, and that wasn't some commentary of somebody else saying something. That was God declaring his holiness. And folks, I'll say it again. Holiness is not just a label. It's not a label. And it's not a denomination. And it's not an old-time religion. It is the character and the nature of God. Put Ephesians 4.24 up. Ephesians 4.24 says this, And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Put on the new man. When we come to God, there should be a change in our life. There should be a conversion that takes place when we get the Holy Ghost. Now, I know, it, it, trust me, I know it, it goes with different rates and different people. And sometimes they just start with creeping things. Some people, if you see, if you see them working on creeping things, you're shouting the victory. We've got a little progress. Other people kind of move a little faster. There's, they start dealing with other stuff here and there. But that new man, that ye put on the new man, there is a choice within us to choose the character and nature of God. That that be on display in our lives, which is created in righteousness and true holiness. See, holiness is an impartation that comes, and if you're writing things down, write this one down. Holiness is an impartation that comes from submission to God. It comes from submission to God that ye put on. There is, we must allow ourselves, we must choose to submit ourselves to the authority of the word and to the authority of the spirit of God. I heard one preacher say, he said, I've got a surefire way of getting new converts to heaven. I said, okay, tell me your surefire way of getting new converts to heaven. He said, we get them to repent, we baptize them in Jesus' name, we get them filled with the Holy Ghost, we put them out on the street to, to evangelize, and the next day we shoot them before they backslide. <laughs> Surefire way to get them to heaven. You have to submit yourself. It is an impartation of the nature of God that comes through submission to God. And submitting to the Spirit of God that's on the inside of us. And submitting to the word of God. When we live in holiness. When we have holiness on the inside. What we have believed. What we have experienced. What we have practiced. Is one of the things that's offered to us. It is a package. Because holiness brings peace into your life. Holiness is a protection. It is a protection from the world. If you compromise holiness, you allow the stress and you allow all of it, everything that comes with worldliness to come into your spirit. You allow that to infiltrate, infiltrate your spirit. And the state's answer to that, you know what the state answer is? Pass more laws, build bigger prisons, and have better law enforcement. And that's their answer. God's answer is repent 
and be baptized in Jesus' name and be filled with the Holy Ghost and let holiness, let holiness build a, build a, a barrier around you that will protect you, that will keep you. It's holiness that brings about a spiritual change in the heart of a man or a woman that nothing else can do. That nothing else can do. Holiness is not something that you decide to do. You can't buy a book and be holy. I've read books on holiness. You can't buy a book and be holy. They're good books. Some of them are good books. Some of them weren't worth the money I paid for. Some of them were good. But reading a book is not going to make you holy. You can't, you can't make a list. Joining a church doesn't make you holy. Shaking the preacher's hand does not make you holy. Holiness is an impartation. You can't learn to be holy. And let me tell you something else. You can't dictate holiness. You can't dictate holiness. Because holiness has to come from the inside. And you cannot dictate what's inside of a person. Because a person can look holy on the outside and have filthy on the inside. And they, they are not holy. They may have the packaging. But if you unwrap the packaging, you're not getting a good gift. Because what's inside is not good. You have to be holy on the inside. That's why we talk about the Holy Ghost, the holy temple of God. We talk about a holy place and holy garments. You read through the Bible. There's so many things. Psalm 30 verse 4 says, Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. Just praise God for his holiness. Psalm 47, 8, God reigneth over the heathen. God sitteth upon the throne of his holiness. Psalm 66, God hath spoken in his holiness. I will rejoice. I will divide Shechem and meet out the valley of Sukkot. Psalm 99, 5, exalt ye the Lord our God and worship at his footstool for he is holy. Exalt the Lord, Psalm 99, 9, our God and worship at his holy hill for the Lord our God is holy. Isaiah 5, 16, but the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. You read through the Bible, God sets aside offerings as holy sacrifices. The Bible speaks of the Sabbath day as being holy. The tithe is holy. Offerings are holy. The name of God is holy. The tabernacle is holy. The law is holy. Commandments are holy. Throughout the Bible, God's holiness conforms or, or confirms the character and the nature of who God is. Hebrews 12.10. Put it up there real quick. For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. I want God's holiness. I want to be holy for he is holy. I want his holiness not, not to be just something we talk about, something we claim to be. I want it to be something that we live and something we are every single day. We are holy. We are God's holy people. Let me tell you something. A holy lifestyle brings glory to a holy God. When you live a holy lifestyle, you are bringing glory to a holy God. You look at the Old Testament. They went through and they anointed that, that, that tabernacle that they built in the wilderness. They anointed the tabernacle and they sanctified it, the Bible says, and they made it holy because that was where they worshipped God. That's why they you would walk in and you would walk into the First, the, the gate where the linen curtains were, and you'd walk in, and, and then there, were, there was the brazen altar, or the bloody brazen altar of repentance where sacrifices were offered, and then the labor of water. But when you got to the next place, you walked in, it was called the holy place. Why? Because the presence of God was there. They, they served God in there. There were no windows there. There, were no, there, there was nothing. You could not see the world. You couldn't see anything going on outside of the 
holy place. They separated themselves under the holy place. You walk past the, the golden candlestick and the table of showbread and you come up to the altar of incense and, and then beyond the altar of incense hung the curtain that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. And the high priest entered the holy of holies one time a year. One time a year. They served the holy place by course every day. Every day they served in the holy place. But one time a year, the high priest would enter the holy of holies. And he would walk in there to bring the blood off the sacrifice of the altar. And bring it in and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. And if God accepted the sacrifice, he lived. If he didn't, he died. And they would go in there. And they would go in that place. You see, the holier the place. You had the outer court. It was large. You had the holy place. It was smaller. You had the holy of holies. It was even smaller. And the holier the place becomes, the more restricted it becomes. The holier the place is, the more restricted it is. It becomes smaller. What are you saying? I'm saying that the influence in the outer court is a whole lot different than the influence in the holy place. And the influence in the holy place was even more different than the influence in the holy of holies because the, more, the closer you get, the holier you get, you have to lay things aside. I told you earlier, you don't pick up things in the kingdom without laying stuff down. You don't, you, you don't achieve things in the kingdom without giving something up. You have to, you, you, want, you want to be more holy than something's got to go. Something's got to go. You want to seek a deeper holiness in God than something's got to go. And it was in that holy of holies where the glory of God was revealed. It was in the holy of holies where God would talk with the high priest and God would meet with the high priest. There was no source of light in the holy of holies. The only source of light was when God's glory developed in that place and began to reflect off of the gold on the Ark of the Covenant and the gold on engravings that were on the outer curtains of those walls and the, and the, and, and the things that were there on the top uh, that covered the ceiling that covered the holy place and the engra gold engravings and that reflection of God's glory shining all over that place. Why? Because God's holiness was felt there. And God's holiness. Amen. Folks, there's a call for holiness. Amen. True holiness. Amen. Hebrews 9 and 8. And I know I'm running out of time. And I've got all kinds of scriptures. Nick looked at me when I handed him the list of scriptures. Just rolled in his eyes. He said, you went over the limit, Dad. <laughs> Hebrews 9 and 8, the Holy Ghost, this signified that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as yet the first tabernacle was yet standing. Look at verse 9. Which was a figure for the time then present. What do we call it? A shadow. For the time then present, which were offered both of gifts and sacrifices, that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. Verse 11, but Christ being come as an high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, there was a holy place in the Old Testament. There was a holiest of holies. And the high priest went in to make restitution of sins. But Christ, when he came, he put all of that aside because all of that pointed to him. Everything about the sacrifices, everything about the offering, everything about the blood, everything about the mercy, it all pointed to Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ became our 
high priest of good things to come. Verse 10, chapter 10, verse 14. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. After that he hath said before, this is the covenant, and I will make them, I will make with them after the, after those days, saith the Lord, and I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Previous sacrifices could not protect us, could not cleanse our conscience, but Jesus Christ and the blood of Calvary, he put his laws, how does he do that? He fills us with his spirit. He fills us with the Holy Ghost. Holiness is imparted by God. Holiness is imparted to us by God. We worship him in the beauty of holiness. See, there has to be an inward holiness so there can be an outward holiness. But listen to me a minute. There also has to be a private holiness so that there can be a public holiness. What do you mean private? And private is when you're alone. Private is when nobody's watching. Private is when you're on vacation and the pastor's not there. Hello, hallelujah, amen, glory to God. Private is, is, when, is when nobody else is there to see what's going on. Because for you to display a true public holiness, you've got to live it privately too. You've got to live it privately. Everything, everything is called Christian today. Everything. They call everything Christian today. It's all, it call, it, Christian just covers such a broad banner, it, it doesn't even resemble what it's supposed to be anymore in society and in this world. Everything is called Christian because Christianity has been swayed by public opinion. But the only opinion I'm worried about is his. That's the only opinion I'm worried about. I'm only worried about the opinion of God. And I'm going to close with 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God. And the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. And if any man defile the temple of God, him will God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple Ye are. I've seen people receive the Holy Ghost and never change again and never submit themselves to what they receive and to the will and the mind of God. But God has placed us. The Bible calls it a highway of holy. Are you perfect, Brother Johnston? Oh, goodness, no. Not even close. Not even close. But I'm trying, and I'm striving, and I'm praying, God, I want to be holy as you are holy. You see, it requires submission, obedience. Obedience. We have to obey. God gave chapter after chapter in Leviticus for the children of Israel to obey. And we have to obey. Wherefore, he says, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of what? Flesh and spirit. Cleanse ourselves, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Put off the former man. Put on the new man. I think it's
at Ephesians 4.24. Let's put that scripture up and I'm done. Ephesians 4.24. Put off concerning and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and truth. Are you, are you teaching this tonight, Brother Johnson, because you think we're, we're slipping? No. I think we know where we stand. I, th <coughs> do I think everybody's living everything. Probably not. Probably not. Do we have all have room to improve? Probably so. But I just want to make sure we know where the foundation is. I just want to make sure we know that holiness is part of the foundation. And it's inward holiness. I can't be holy if I've got unforgiveness. And I can't be holy if I've got bitterness and malice and strife and anger and hatred. I can't be holy if I allow carnality to dwell up here. And I allow that carnality to influence my way I live. I can't be holy if I try to live one way publicly and another way privately. I can't be holy if I'm just holy outwardly, but I'm not holy inwardly. There's a call to holiness. There's power in holiness. There's glory in holiness. That's where the glory fell, the holy of holies. There's glory in holiness. Would you stand with me tonight? I want us to sing this song, Sister Missy. Is playing. I want to live a holy life. I want that to be our prayer. I want us to sing that as a prayer. God, I want to live a holy life. I want to stay true day and night. Let's sing. Oh, I want to live a holy life. I want to walk in truth day and night. I want to be all that I can be pure. 